Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, I'm Fabrizio Piccareta, Athletic Director of uh, Rome City Institute and Soccer Management Institute. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you guys that have uh, decided to attend this webinar. Uh, by the look of the list of the coaches, I can see the names of some very good old friends of mine. Uh, so this is something that uh, makes me happy uh, to be here. Um, I would like, first of all, to introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm uh, from Genoa. I'm 58 years old, with a pro license coach since 2016. Uh, I work in football um, <clears throat> since 2011, professionally. I work uh, in many countries uh, in Europe. Uh, I had lot of experiences but my main uh, point of interest has, has always been uh, uh, how to create a learning environment especially for uh, for our youth players for young players because I think that um, if we talk about adult football uh, anything uh, we can do anything uh, as long as we win games uh, we all know that uh, football is a uh, is a result uh, based business but when we talk about how to uh, develop uh, young players i think that we we should uh, start from uh, from a base uh, or from some principles that tonight uh, uh, i'm here to share with uh, with all of you hoping that uh, uh, we can agree on something and if we don't i think that is a good uh, is a good base to start uh, debate and discussion. Uh, mm, exactly uh, about that, I want to say that if you want at the end of the my presentation, uh, if you want to ask some questions, there is um, the Q and A uh, space where you can type your uh, your questions, and uh, I can I will be very happy to to answer your uh, your questions. Um, let's see how 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 long it will it will last my my presentation. I will try to keep it uh, short, but not too much because I think that some uh, some uh, topics are not are so important that we have to to go a bit in depth. So uh, if we are all in, I will start to share my my screen and uh, I will start to talk about my my uh, ideas uh, on how to create a learning environment. Okay, first of all, uh, let me tell you why I decided to, to, to name this uh, webinar, uh, how creating a learning environment. Um, we all live uh, in our daily life, we all live in, uh, in, in an environment. It can be a, a working environment, can be a sports environment, can be a familiar environment, a family environment. But uh, basically, we all live in, uh, in places where uh, the elements of environment can affect our daily life, can affect our way of doing things, can affect our, our way to learn some, how to do something. So um, this is why I think that tonight I'm not going to share with you drills or uh, exercises or um, something related to uh, specific situations uh, on the field, but more uh, about the principles that underline this, um, my, my way of doing things, my, my methodology, which is also, of course, our Soccer Management Institute uh, uh, methodology. Um, so, since uh, I would say 15 years ago, maybe, uh, during my, my journeys in football, my journeys around the, around the world in, in different countries, I had the chance to, um, to experiment and to live different, uh, different environments, different ways to, um, to learn, uh, to, to, to play different ways to um, different, different cultures, different societies. But the main question that I, I pose myself has been always 
the, the following. So I called it the, the question. So who or what is responsible for learning skills of an activity such as soccer or football? Um, this is, in my opinion, this is a, a, the main question we should uh, ask ourselves. Uh, so we all know that uh, as a human beings, we, we learn how to do things uh, in, uh, in two main ways. There are two channels to, to learn any activities or any um, topic or uh, anything. Uh, basically, we, we learn in two ways. So we learn by memory and we learn by experience. And this is something that we have to take uh, uh, to, to bear in mind when we uh, approach our um, profession as coaches, because uh, sometimes we, uh, we use uh, a channel that is not exactly what uh, is required by, by, by the activity that we, we, want to, we want to teach or uh, we want to transfer to our our kids in this case uh, to our players. So uh, memory is something that is related to uh, to our to the way our brain get informations from uh, from uh, the environment. So I mean from people by by talking by uh, teaching. So is more related about something. Uh, that someone else transferred to us. So, for example, um, when I when I go in a, in a, in a place and I meet people, uh, I start to understand from them how uh, their names, their age, uh, whatever. And this has to do with my memory. And all this for this information go through uh, some certain areas of my brain. Uh, and they give me, um, they, they, I learn uh, with this channel. But for all regarding, for everything regarding the, the motor skills, the motor activities, so everything we do with our body, everything we do with, uh, with our movement, um, the main channel uh, of uh, our um, learning is by experience. As I, as I, as you can see from here, I put some, uh, you know, drawings about um, a young, a young, a young uh, child growing up. Uh, you, you can see, we can see that, uh, and everyone as a, as a child can, can tes testify that uh, our kids, our young kids, don't learn through our voice, don't learn, don't learn how to move or how to walk by our instructions. But they they do it with their own experience. They do it by trials and, and errors. They do it by doing things, by trying to 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 do their activity. And this is something that uh, is important for us because when we create our our learning environment, specifically in uh, in our activities, which is football, we have to understand that our kids learn by uh, in these two two ways, uh, through these two channels, as coaches, we we should know exactly when to uh, affect them their their learning by uh, their memory or by their experience, and we will see some uh, how to do that. First of all, I would like just because we are talking about environment, I would like to give a, a definition of environment. Of course. Uh, can be a physical environment, but this is something more related to everything, all the elements that are inside the environment and can, can uh, be also uh, not just the, the structure of the environment, but specifically the, the relationship uh, of the environment, the, the elements of the environment and how these uh, elements can affect uh the ski our skills uh, our children's skills uh, our player skills so basically uh, the definition of our environment all the all of the elements facts conditions and events 
that affect someone or something at a specific time and in a specific place. As I said before, um, everything we do is affected by the environment. Uh, so if I want to learn uh, how to, uh, to ski, uh, of course, the environment is, ba is made by something. It is made by um, uh, the, the snow in this case and the, my skiing. And, and these are the elements of the, of the skiing environment. If I want to learn how to swim, of course, there is a specific environment and the water, of course, and, and, and that's it, because this is the only, the only elements can, that can affect my, my learning, uh, my swim, how, how I learn, to, um, the way I learn how to swim. Uh, but now we are talking about our sports, which is, uh, which is football. And uh, I want to, to talk, to share with you something that of course is uh, is easy to understand but um, these are the elements of football so uh, these four elements uh, are the base are the main um, elements of every uh, football activity so uh, one ball goals or directions because the goals are not just the 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 mean of the of the activity itself but the the goals are what give directions to 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 the game to the play to the game um boundaries because boundaries are are important and at least one teammate and two opponents why i'm saying at least one teammate and two opponents because uh if we if we have one player against another one it's not pro exactly football because football is a, is a collective sport and the collaboration between between the the players is uh, is important is is the nature of the game so when we have whatever we want to do whatever we want to wherever we are if we have a, a place to, where to play uh, one ball directions two goals so the the, the, the targets uh, that we our players have to reach and the boundaries, we have the basic elements of football. And from there, we can already talk about learning environment. Uh, if, we, if we take off one of the elements, or if we add more elements to the game, let's say if you want to, for example, uh, if we do some drills, and uh, of course we can do that, but we have to know what we are, where we are doing. If we do drills with, more than one ball we have to understand that an extra ball is something that changes the environment and is not anymore related to to the to the reality of the of the of the game so uh, when we build our learning environment we have to take in account these elements and we have to know that whatever we do without this element these elements or adding more elements uh, to this environment uh, it makes it makes us um, going a bit far away from the reality of the game and the main the first thing i want to uh, highlight tonight is especially with the very young kids so kids that start to play football uh, so at the, their, the beginning of their activity we should um, we should make sure that these basic elements are there and we don't change them because in my opinion the main thing is to make them understand the sense of the game so what does it mean to play football football is a game where two teams play against each other with one ball trying to get uh, target to reach a target which is score a goal in opponent uh, scoring the opponent goal why boundaries are important for me the boundaries are, are important especially uh, in the in the first uh, stage of uh, of development because our kids have to understand that if the ball goes out of the boundaries there are consequences so 
uh, again, if we do something that uh, that don't require boundaries or we don't, or let's say like use walls, you know, where the ball can rebound uh, and be always in the game, we are get getting a bit far from the reality of the game. Okay, so. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to talk about, um, of course, again, talking about the environment. And uh, we saw how uh, the elements can affect uh, this environment. I want to talk uh, about how the environment affects the learning, the learning process. And uh, in, in this regard, we have first to, uh, sh to, to split um, the skills in two main categories, closed skills and open skills. And this is very important because uh, there are sports where the closed skills are uh, the base, are the nature of the, the activity. Uh, not only sports, but all of the human activities, uh, open, closed skills and open skills are what we are more interested in because our sports Football is an open skill activity, but let's see the the, the, two dif the difference between closed skills and open skills. Closed skills are those for which the environment is predictable, as it is almost perfectly stable, so that the motor action can be planned in advance. Uh, as you can see here, the this uh, weird guy trying to dance. Uh, dancing, for example, is a closed skill activity because we can plan, we can plan our action uh, from the beginning to to the end. So from the, uh, the start to the end. Uh, sports like, let's say, darts, um, swimming, um, other sports where the environment is predictable. Um, and of course, the way we, we, we structure our session is different from uh, other activities, other sports. So if I want to, um, to learn how to dance, um, the environment doesn't affect me because it's me uh, and I have to uh, learn how to, to move uh, according to the routine I want to, I want to learn. But there is nothing and nobody uh, who can affect my um, my attempt to to learn how to do that. Uh, let's see. Let's watch an example. So, for example, here we have seven years old girls. Uh, doing gymnastics and in this case uh, you can see these very young girls doing something very difficult on the beam uh, on the parallels whatever they 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 do is a, is a highly um, is a very high difficult activity uh, but in this case as we can see, this is a close, a proper close skill activity because the environment never changed. So, for example, this little girl who uh, learned how to 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 do his activities on the on the beam, uh, she knows that the, the 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 environment is perfectly stable because the beam is always uh, has always the same height, the same width. Uh, she knows exactly what she she has to do she can plan in advance all uh, uh, the action and by trying and trying and repeating the same movement she can finally reach the uh, level that is required for this kind of action this kind of activity which is uh, again for example another example okay this this is a video that I found on YouTube just today because uh, it's it's uh, quite uh, common to to see something like that. This is a 11 years old archer 
um, I can go straight to the end of the of the video to see what she does, the 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 accuracy of uh, her action. And she's just eleven years old. But and can we can we talk? Uh, and can we, by watching her, like here, for example, now she tries to to hit uh, an apple, and she will uh, she will uh, she will do that as you as you can see. We can say that this girl probably by 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 training every day, like she probably does, we can say that she is an archer. So, but the, um, the main thing is, once again, her activity is perfectly uh, planned in advance. She, nobody uh, affect her. There is nothing in the, in, the, um, in the environment, people or elements that can affect their, her um, learning, learning process. What is... Um, Open skills. Open skills activities are, of, of course, are different because open skills are defined as those for which the environment is in constant and very often, unpredict very often unpredictable change, so that the performer cannot effectively plan the entire movement in advance. And this is what uh, we face every every day when uh, when um, our kids. Play play football. Let's see a couple of uh, let's watch a couple of videos. Here, for example, is a is a video of few of uh, young players playing soccer, playing football, uh, and we can see how the the environment can change uh, dramatically the the action of the players because. See here, for example, this this uh, this this player uh, with the ball. Uh, he couldn't pl um, plan in advance his action, of course, because the environment is made by the ball, the speed of the ball, the opponents, his teammates, and 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 everything else, you know, on, on the field. So how how can these kids? learn their activities if not in the in the proper environment in their uh, real environment one another thing that is important to take in account uh, in building our learning environment is um, related to a, a recent discovery recent i mean in the late uh, 90s uh, in Italy, Giacomo Rizzolatti uh, is a neuroscientist, and uh, with his staff, they discover the mirror neurons, which is which is something that has changed the way uh, we uh, refer to um, to learning. So these mirror neurons are responsible for uh, a lot of uh, our learning process because uh, has to be mm, has, has been discovered that our mirror neurons are responsible for the way we 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 watch the other and then we can learn from the others and so by by this system the new this um, neural system we know what we do we know what we will do we not what you what someone else is doing because uh, is exactly like that, like the word says, is a mirror. So we can mirror them and see uh, by their actions what they're what they doing and what they are going to do. And this is again something very important related to our uh, the way we structure our environment. Before before. Um, the discovery of this uh, this um, neural system, mirror system, uh, let's say in the last century, uh, there was this hierarchical model called also serial model. 
So according to this model, every single neural stimulus uh, is totally elaborated inside a specific cerebral area before moving to the next one. So uh, this is still, uh, okay, this is valid for, as we said before, for memory. So let's say if I meet someone and I learn his name, this information go through an area of, of my brain and remains as a memory. But uh, with the recent discoveries uh, has been, uh, has been um, so this is again the serial model. So there is this, the, the, the stimulus from outside. And according to this, system, to this model, the, the information uh, go to the sensorial area, then to the areas of association and to the motor area and then becomes a movement, motion. But again, with this uh, new discoveries, the recent discoveries has been, um, uh, this is Giacomo Rizzolatti. So um, now, uh, so the, 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 the process is, is being discovered that is for the motion, the, for the motor skills and the motor action, it's been uh, discovered that these areas of association are not involved because there is the, the, the information that comes from the environment and this information goes to the premotor area, then to the motor area, then becomes motion. So there is no, um, um, the area of, of association is not, is not involved in this, in this process, which is, um which is true because sometimes when you see we see something some players doing something we we can say that uh it's not even they're not even thinking what they do because there, there is no time to think about so something that can uh, um is part of reaction rather than um than action than decision Another mm, very important thing about the mirror neurons is that they work if there is a, uh, let's say, a, a, a reason why, a reason for the movement. So um, the visual, especially visual motor neurons are responsible for motor acts and they are, they are activated when the movement is aimed to, uh, at a purpose. Um, what does it mean? That if the movement is not aim and, and any purpose, there is no activation of the, the, the mirror neurons. And this is something that is important because when we watch some, someone doing something, we'll, uh, our um, neurons, our mirror neurons activate only if we watch someone doing something aimed at the purpose with a with a, with a, with a purpose so if there is a target to reach then our mirror system activate and this is why we learn by watching the others but if we, if we watch someone doing something aimless, aimlessly um, we we don't activate our our mirror system that don't activate and we don't uh, learn, but if we watch someone doing something uh, with a purpose, then this is the way we'll, we we learn. So, uh, taking these things in account, how we can shape our learning environment? Um, there is something that we can we can. Um, we can say about the main uh, discussion, main debate, uh, if it's important to, um, to make our children work uh, without, out of the context or uh, in the context, in the real game, in the real situation. But there are moments, especially when they're young, where we have to understand that they have to build their affordance with the ball. Affordance is a, is a concept uh, discovered by um, an English uh, psychologist, G James Gibson, and is referred to the relationship that 
all of us as a human beings uh, have with uh, with an object all the object that we we use during uh, our daily life and especially specifically for our, for our um, sport we have to understand that the relationship with the ball is uh, is the main thing uh, so our kids have to build this affordance with the ball uh, so all the activities individual activities that uh, can build this uh, uh, affordance, this relationship between our kid and the ball are important. So all the activities such as, for example, uh, juggling or uh, hitting the, a wall with the ball or uh, dribbling the ball uh, um, his own, all the things are important because they allow our kids to build this affordance, which is what we want from our kids. What we have to understand, by the way, is that by doing this, they are not learning how to play football. Uh, they are just building the affordance. So one mistake that we can make is... Uh, make our players, our kids, doing this kind of activities, thinking that these activities is something that will make them learn how to play football. Uh, this is a big mistake. This is important, but it's important to build this kind of uh, affordance. Because there is the affordance with, with the, the ball, but much more important is the affordance with the environment. So, uh, and this affordance with the environment is only possible by uh, doing something that is related to the um, reality of the game. So, if we want to build the affordance with the environment of our players, we make we have to make them um, playing and experiencing the reality of of the game. So, what we should uh, we should do. Uh, especially when when they're very young uh, making them make sure that they will work uh, with both both channels so the one uh, channel they build their affordance with the ball and on an, the other channel they will build their affordance with the environment so one thing doesn't exclude the other but um, we have to make sure that they live the, the, the say well, they 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 experience the two things together but but if we can and this is something I I, I learned by watching some clubs uh, as much as possible all the activities that uh, are good to build the affordance should be um, developed outside of the training time well uh, what what is being called um, homeworks. So if we have kids, if we can uh, create an environment where our kids, outside of their training time, they can uh, uh, use um, this time to to practice their own uh, deliberately, uh, just with the ball, then with the ball, one player with the ball, uh, doing everything that can that can help them to build and improve this affordance with the ball. And when they are in the in training, make them in the, uh, straight away in the in the reality of the of, of the of the game. So make them play. Then in this way we should uh, we could we can um, have players that have the ability to manage the, the ball, to dominate the ball, but in the same time, the ability to use these uh, uh, skills in the right context, uh, because decision making is uh, is possible. Uh, to learn decision making is possible only by by playing. So we cannot uh, help our players to take any decisions if we don't put them in the in the real uh, in a real situation. And this. Mm, this is what it means affordance, build a, a affordance with the environment. So, 
um, the environment is something that uh, is complex, okay? Because if we want to uh, to create a um, proper learning environment, we have, first of all, we have to understand that football is a complex activity and we cannot uh, take away from the environment the elements or some elements. Because if we want to, uh, if we if we take something out from the environment, we think that we help our players to uh, to see things and to make things more easily. But um, it's not, in my opinion, it's not the right way to do that because every single element can affect the um, the process, and this doesn't mean that. Uh, if our players struggle, they're not learning. Maybe this struggle struggle is what helped them to overcome the difficulties and to um, and to learn within the context, within the environment. Uh, one thing that is important for me, I want to show you this um, short video, uh, is the importance to. Uh, start from uh, the whole. So like like I, I wrote here, the whole is more than the sum of the single elements. So what what we sometimes another mistake that we we make is, as I said before, we would like to break down football in all the small elements that compose it. But this is, uh, in my opinion, this is not not the way. Because if we if we take something out from the this complexity, uh, we 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 do something different. So uh, we should start from the whole, and then maybe uh, to uh, after our players have understood the whole. So I mean the sense of the game. Then maybe we can start to uh, to work on specific things. But if we do the opposite, they will never have the sense of the game, the whole. And this is why, for example, that I, I, I found this, uh, this video, which is, in my opinion, is, uh, is very interesting. Just to... Okay, this is a, a, an artist, a Czech artist, who built these um, sculptures, let's say, by using uh, things that he uh, finds, and by doing this, then he recreate the portrait of uh, of people. This is Franz Kafka, for example. But if we if we don't watch the whole uh, perspective, if we don't take the, if we don't watch this. Um, the sculpture from a, from a, the right perspective, so um, taking account the whole, then we lose the sense of the of the, um, the sculpture itself. Here, for example, these are all shoes, but if we watch from the right perspective, we uh, we can see the portrait of a, of a man of this man. So why uh, I I wanted to show you this um, this video because this is in my opinion the sense of uh, what I meant uh, talking about uh, making sure that our kids have first they can learn first the sense of the game they have to learn what does it mean to play what is uh, football and from there then they will have uh, the chance to learn um, what uh, makes this uh, this activity. But if they don't get first the whole sense of the game, then they will miss something. And if we, if we focus on the on the element on the single element without taking account of the whole, then this is a in my opinion this is can prevent our players to, to become mm, better decision makers. And this is a representation of uh, what I was saying. So 
On the left, the, we can see you know, the single colors. And on the right, uh, we see uh, an image that is made of all these colors, but all these colors are mixed and is a, is a, is a mess. But this is the reality of, uh, of, uh, of an open skill activity like such as football. And this is the way our kids play and learn. But as coaches, sometimes we want to um, break down all the elements and, uh, and try to work them separately without taking account that all the elements are strictly related to the others. And this is, uh, uh, the, this is not real. If we work on just one element of the environment or of football, we don't... Um, we are not taking account the, the all these connections between between the these elements. So um, once again, when we coach and when we build our learning environment, we can do uh, different things. I I named these three categories of drills. Um, they're all so all the drills that we we do all the activity that we do in a, in a session in a training session can be uh, placed in one of the three categories uh, i call them non football drills football like drills and game practice so all the th the, the drills that goes in three these three categories are uh, good i mean anything is good anything can be uh, practice but as coaches we have to know what we are coaching by uh, using a drill so let's say non-football drills i call non-football drills all the drills that are far uh, from the reality of the game let's say as i said before juggling is not is not football juggling is just a a, a, a kid a player that juggle with the ball is not playing football is doing something that builds is affordance with the with the ball and as i said before all these drills are good to can be uh, practiced but we have to know exactly what we are doing then there is another category and i call it football like drills football like means that if someone watch from outside can say or can can think that there is uh, some elements of football involved, but still is not a proper uh, game of football, game practice. For example, positional games without directions, or even mm, you know, recreating a small structure, a smaller section of a game to, let's say, to work on uh, the defensive, um, on a defensive situation. Uh, rondos with, uh, with big space, um, everything that can be um, uh, related to football, but is not exactly, it doesn't uh, have all the elements of football. Uh, and these drills are important, especially at, an, at, the, at an older age. So, not, uh, so when, when the sense of the game has been already uh, acquired by, by the players. And this way we can, let's say, we can uh, work on uh, the different elements of the game. We can change them. We can change the shape. We can uh, make the space bigger or, uh, or uh, smaller. But we know that our players have already uh, the sense of the game. And in this way, we can um, work on something specific. So uh, with football like drills, I like to say that we make something to, to emerge to coach it. So, for example, if I want to work on uh, uh, reaggression after losing the ball, I can create something that can uh, make this situation emerge and then I'm, I'm going to coach it, which is important because we want something to, uh, to happen often, often to make sure that our players can, uh, can work on it. And the last, the third, and probably, in my opinion, the main and most important uh, 
category is the game practice. So when we uh, make our players um, experience the game, and this um, doesn't mean uh, 11 v 11 or we have, so everything that uh, involve the, those basic elements that I said before. So one ball, uh, directions of play, boundaries and opponents and teammates, this is game practice. When we use the game practice, we are not making something happen to coach it, but we have to coach what happens. We have to coach what emerges from the, the game. And this is the, in my opinion, the highest uh, level of uh, uh, coaching. And this is the most difficult one uh, based on my experience, but it's the more rewarding. And this is the, the way our players learn the most because we don't create something uh, that can sound fake because we want something to happen. Uh, but in this way, we let the game uh, create the situations in a, in a natural way. And our players will experience also the unpredictability of the game. And this is the, what we, um, we want. But as coaches, we should leave this uh, complexity and we should leave this game practice and be able to observe what happened and coach it. Co to coach something in the game practice means not just um, giving instructions or uh, corrections, but also reinforcing when something has been done well. And this is probably the most, the most effective uh, uh, coaching mo point, coaching moment, because um, based on my experience, I could see that if something has been done correctly in the, in the right way, and we reinforce this, we give a positive feedback, then this feedback uh, affect every everyone else. Uh, it, it's sharing with the in the environment, and everyone wants to uh, feel the same the same uh, feedback, the same positive feedback. And this is why, in my opinion, and this is part of the emotional side of uh, coaching, is much better uh, to praise our our kids, especially when they're young rather than give them uh, a negative feedback on their mistakes. So uh, let's make sure that in our environment, there is more praising than uh, blaming. One thing that I, I think sometimes we forget, especially in the, at the younger age, at the younger age, is coaching the game cycle. So, what is the game cycle? The game cycle is the uh, are the four phases of the game that uh, they're constantly fo one follow each uh, they follow each other constantly. So in every single football game, can be a youth game or can be Champions League game, these four phases of the play are always there. So there are four moments, and these four moments uh, are the nature of the game. So the first one. We call it possession. Basically, is uh, we have the ball, our team have the ball. Then we can lose the ball, and we call it uh, transi negative transition or defensive transition. Then, at, at some point, the opponent have the ball, and uh, we can regain the ball. And this cycle uh, going, keep going. There is there is also, of course, the fifth phase, which is the set pieces, the set plays, but we are not interested in this moment. This is not the topic of the of the uh, of tonight. So what, in my opinion, sometimes as coaches we lack, especially at a younger age, is that we forget that our kids can understand or they have to understand the four moments of the game. This is something that, in my opinion, uh, is uh, left just to when they're old, when they they grow. But this is, in my opinion, uh, a, met a methodological, mis a didactical mistake. So, uh, what's wrong in uh, let our kids understand uh, 
the consequences of losing the ball or uh, or what to do uh, when the opponents have the ball. Um, this is the nature of the game. And if we can coach these uh, four moments, even by just doing small uh, things to make our kids understand uh, the, the principles for every single phase, I think that we will, find, we will have, when they, they grow, we will have players that understand better and they can perform better, they can uh, behave better in the four moments of the game. And this is something, in my opinion, that um, I don't see often, uh, especially in the junior academies. Again, um, football is a complex activity. So complex means that all the elements are related and strictly related uh, each other and uh, everything can affect something else. If we forget this, we are not, in my opinion, um, giving our players the, the right uh, tools to, to learn. Um, we don't have to think that the complexity means uh, complicated. Complex, complex doesn't mean complicated. Complex means, um, again, uh, taking in account that all the elements together can, uh, can affect our, our skills, our player skills. And as I said here, uh, we have to take in account this contextual interference because the, um, this interference during the practice is beneficial to skill learning. So if we, if we keep things too easily, too easy in, in training, then this uh, learning um, curve will uh, drop too soon. Why, for example, if we keep this complexity uh, in our training sessions, then even through these difficulties, this struggling, our players will retain this um, uh, improvement in the in the long term and this is uh, something that has been studied and it's been um, proved by of course by uh, by experience by by doing this uh, by using this kind of uh, of um, um, process three um, sentences that from three different people uh, which i think that um, I use, I've always used, used these three uh, principles as part of my um, methodology because I think that uh, are three key points. The first one has been said by uh, is been said by Corrado Sinigaglia. Corrado Sinigaglia is an is an Italian neuroscientist, and he said, "When I act with uh, when I act with someone aiming for my same target, my brain doesn't just plan my action." but from the beginning takes it as part of a jigsaw of which the others are part. So this uh, is true and in my opinion uh, should give us always the, um, the idea that uh, the real game scenario is something that help our players to understand better um, what they have to the decision make, that they have to make because they can uh, not plan because they cannot plan, but by, um, by living with, uh, with the others, by living with the teammates and also opponents, they can uh, learn how to take decisions on the field. Another um, important sentence is the this one from uh, uh, Schmidt from um, Richard Schmidt who was uh, uh, an, uh, a scientist uh, and he used to um, to to write a lot about motor skills he said that it is difficult to isolate a movement from its environment the environment influences the movement but the movement also changes the environment and this is true, and this is why, in my opinion, um, 
the environment has always to be taken in account. As I said, uh, for, I give an example. Uh, if I want to uh, my my kid to learn uh, to control the ball uh, until there will, will there uh, there will be opponents trying to to steal the ball to him or to um, avoid him to control this ball. This uh, this learning won't work. Won't, will uh, will uh, will be over soon. Will be dropped soon. So we have to make sure that everything is affected by the environment. And the last one, again uh, from uh, the Italian an Italian neuroscientist Giacomo Rizzolatti, and he said that the accumulation of experiences, trials and errors relentlessly enriches the rep repertoire of motor acts, especially during development. The richer, richer and more articulated the repertoire is, the more the human being is able to produce difficult and daring movements. And this is, uh, again, what I was saying before. We don't have to think that if we simplify things to our kids, uh, we make them um, learn faster. So if we can, if they can learn in uh, in the complexity of the of the of the of the of the environment, they will uh, retain this um, learning in the long term. Okay, uh, I used the, to to show this um, this picture every time because i think that can uh, can give a uh, an example of what it means to um to stay in an in a real environment with uh, and struggling rather than have an, an easy life so there are two tigers on the left we have the zoo tiger on the right we have the jungle tiger and underneath there are the score uh, of uh, different skills so the zoo tiger uh, is in the, of course, is in his cage, uh, is not free, but has an easy life. As you can see uh, underneath, an easy score is a very high, high uh, score because every single day there is someone who uh, provides her uh, with water, with food, and she doesn't need to, to fight for a life or to fight for a, for a getting uh, the food every day and the water. She is very safe because yes, is in the cage, but nobody can enter the cage to 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 put her in danger. So again, the his safety is very score is very high. Amount of struggle is very low because uh, for this reason that I just uh, mentioned. She doesn't need to, to struggle to get uh, every, everything she needs. But on the other side of the coin, the problem is that her survival potential will be uh, an existing, so it will be very low. The end, she never developed skills because she doesn't need to, because she doesn't face any challenges. While on the right, we have the jungle tiger because, and the jungle tiger uh, has a very low easy score because she doesn't have an easy life. This, her safety is very low because every single day she's out in the jungle. She has to fight with the, with the prey, uh, with the predators and she she has to uh, take shelter. She has to defend herself from uh, from uh, from any danger, and she has an amount, a very high amount of struggle for these reasons. But uh, in uh, in the same time, she develop she has developed a very high survival potential, and she has developed uh, high skills because she ch faced challenges every single day. So what does it mean? That if we want to give an easy life to our kids we, we and we don't create an environment where, where they develop these skills by struggling, by facing challenges and uh, uh, live 
the real context of what uh, they will find then in uh, in the real game we are not giving them the right tools and the and the best tools to to become uh, jungle tigers one thing that um, <clears throat> In my opinion, this is the, the target we should strive. So there is this uh, um, stages of competence um, scheme uh, here. So on the first, the first uh, column, we have poor intention anticipation. So uh, what does it mean? We have a player that have poor intention and poor anticipation is unaware of uh, his ability and we can say that is unconscious in, in competent, incompetent so this is the very lowest uh, level of uh, of competence so a player that mm, doesn't know how to to play uh, is not even uh, aware of uh, his uh, poor abilities and is not conscious uh, of his incompetence by the time he grows and he um, improves, he will be, he will have better intention anticipation. He will start to be aware of his ability. Uh, and But at this stage, he will be conscious about his incompetence. And this is the, mm, the first step, let's say, of improving. Then, if he will uh, get better, he will start to have good intention anticipation. So what it means, good uh, reading of the game, good uh, um, decision making. He will be aware of this and he will start to be conscious of his competence. But the last, the last and uh, possibly the best, the best uh, level of players are those players who have the best intention anticipation and they can switch from being aware or unaware of their action. And we can say that are unconsciously competent. So they can do things sometimes in uh, uh, by taking decisions, but sometimes they will do things we, even without thinking. And if we think about the best players in the world, they we will can we can see uh, often very often they they do things that we can say he didn't even think about it. So um, to sum up, I think that um, when we build our learning environment, we should make sure that we uh, have in our um, program in our uh, methodology these uh, key points first the specific specificity so the closer the closer your practice resemble resembles a game the better is for you because the game teaches the game so we should put our players in a bit of struggling struggle because we learn better when things are a bit tougher and force us to think and plan and plan before each rep. Um, of course, we should use the random practice instead of block practice. Block practice are good for um, affordance. So when we repeat uh, often the same movement, the same uh, skill, the same uh, routine, we are just building the affordance with the ball. But if we use random practice, this leads to uh, more retention um, of the of the skill itself. The whole against the part. So we should learn the whole skill that rather than learning a part. Uh, because as I said before, all the elements are strictly related to each other. So to control the ball, uh, to shoot is different than to control the ball, to pass the ball. So if we learn the whole skill, if our players learn the whole skill is much better than learning a small part of it. And then we should welcome mistakes because mistakes are 
a necessary part of the learning process. So, as I said before, don't blame uh, mistakes because mistakes are part of are the base for the for uh, the next attempt. And by doing these uh, attempts, our players will uh, will uh, will improve um, automatically. So, but if we blame every single mistake, then uh, we we can uh, prevent our players to 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 make another attempt because maybe they will be afraid of our feedback, uh, our judgment, and this is not what we want. So uh, to conclude, and then if we if we can go through some uh, some questions, if we have, if you have. We should strive to model a, a learning environment within which, as coaches, knowing how to recognize the moments in which to be able to affect the conscious decision of our players and instead let the environment itself guide the unconscious action. What does it mean? Um, there are two, as I said, there are two ways, two channels to, to, um, to learn things, the memory and the experience. So when we can affect our players uh, memory when we can give them instructions in the space in what i call the space of decisions so let's say for example um i can i can instruct a player i can help a player how to occupy a space for example so i can show him uh, with words or with the video or whatever uh, uh, i can help him to understand which decision he can make, but I cannot help him uh, to understand uh, or to judge the action that he, 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 he took. So, for example, the way he controlled the ball, this is part of uh, uh, his uh, ability, and I just I can just create the, the right environment to make sure he can make, uh, he can improve. But I can't explain, for example, I can't explain to uh, an eight years old kid how to control a ball. I have just to create the, the, the right conditions to, for him to experience the co how to control a ball. Uh, but I cannot explain to him uh, by, with words what he has to do. Um, so our job in the end is to make sure that the learning environment allows our players to take advantage of both channels. As I said, the, the channel, the, the decision-making channel and the memory channel and the, the uh, and experience channel. And the experience channel is possible only uh, by uh, living in the in the environment of the of the of the game. In, in our case, um the four elements that i mentioned before okay thanks for your attention sorry for my uh sometimes broken english but um to talk without any feedback is uh, even more difficult so i stop sharing my screen now if and see if someone want to Have a, take um, ask a question. I can't see any question. Okay, no, sorry. Okay, Excel. Uh, okay, thank you, Jordan, for uh, your. Um, <clears throat> For your words can i ask what your opinion so jordan tight ask can i ask what your opinion is on opposed drills as part of player development uh, i don't like unopposed drills because i don't think that um, they, they, this type of drills take in account uh, the the reality of the game so uh, especially uh, with regard to decision making 
my decision with the ball is always based on what my opponent is doing uh, in this specific moment. So uh, unopposed drills is something that don't uh, allow our players to live the, um, the real game and they don't give them the tools to improve their decision making. Uh, so there are drills, as I said, that are good for um, affordance, but these uh, drills are uh, uh, effective if they can be performed by you know the relationship with the, the players and the ball. In this case, unopposed drills are more about collective drills, and if there are no opponents, I don't see the um, I don't see them as an effective. Uh, um way to to coach them i hope uh, i answer to to the question uh, matthew thomas if you if youth players are only playing football at training and never outside on their own is is it better to focus on the game practice model with given rules in order to teach principles what are lear learning uh, football like drills okay yes um I agree with the, so if the, the question is uh, um, as inside already the answer, I mean, if uh, our players are not in, um, they don't have the chance to practice their own with, outside of, uh, of the training session, so uh, home or uh, whatever, outside of the training time, I think that the game practice model is the best way to, for them to so I would rather use the game game practice model rather than the individual drills because uh, for me it's important to get for the players for the young players to get the uh, the, the the sense of the game so what I mean um, in a in an old interview uh, Arsène Wenger said something that I agree with. He said that football should be uh, learned first perception, then decision, and uh, in the end, the execution. So this is why if we can't have the time to uh, build affordance, it's much better to use the game practice because within this practice, within this uh, game, uh, the players can develop their own uh, their own uh, skills okay um i i'm not sure if i'm saying the right the right uh, um, name uni uni i'm uni i'm i i'm i hope i said i said it uh, right uh, I want to find out what to do if the environment is not good for the growth of a good play, of a good players. Uh, if I understood your your question, if the environment is not good, if you mean the, I don't know what you mean in terms of an environment not good. Uh, the environment can be, of course, a, a physical environment, an emotional environment, and a learning environment. I think that the learning environment to be good for the growth of the players have to uh, contain what I mentioned before. So the elements of football and make sure that all and the players can experience these elements. So without taking them out uh, from, the, from the environment itself. So, but of course there is also uh, an emotional environment, which is, even more important but this is not the topic of the of this uh, webinar but we should we should uh, and we could talk hours of the uh, emotional side of uh, of uh, coaching so there is no chance to to be effective with our kids with our players if we cannot uh, transfer our, our uh, uh, to them our uh, our emotions so we have to make sure that this kind of environment is uh, positive for them. I don't see other questions. Ah, no, yes, of course. Does close kill Blaine Hale 
asks, does close skill have its place in a session design at every age, or is it more on a spectrum of more to less as they age? I I'm not sure if I understood the the question. Uh, okay, close skills. So in football, there are no space for close skills. I mean, let's say for example, basketball. In basketball. Basketball is an open skill activity like football with moments of closed skills, which are, what are these moments? Are the throw, the free throws. Free throw in, in basket is a closed skill activity because the distance from the player, uh, between the player and the, and the basket is always the same. The height of the basket is always the same. There are no opponents that can affect the, the player who is taking the throw. So this is a proper close skill activity because the, the environment is stable and there are no variation in the, in the, um, in the environment during the action. Um, in football, there is nothing we can compare. Uh, and we, even the, the penalty is not a proper close skill because there is a, a, the opponent goalkeeper who is uh, affecting our decision where to... to to shoot and uh, so there are no close skills activity involved in football once again uh, control the ball I mean using the ball um, in an individual uh, drill to build affordance can be a close skill because uh, the kid is his own with the ball but once again, as long as re, uh, is not in put in in the real in the real context, it's uh, something that it doesn't work. But these kind of drills, I would uh, make sure that they will start to do it uh, to do them at a very young age because um, affordance with the ball is uh, much more effective when they're very young. Uh, but once again. They have to work on their affordance, but straight away in the same time working on the uh, sense of the game. So make them play. So affordance and game, affordance and game. This is something I, I, I would advise. Seba, my friend Sebastiano Costantini, uh, in this idea of football, how do you put the physical training? Uh, Seba, to say a fitness coach, Sebastiano Costantini is my friend. Is a fitness coach. Um, in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, physical training has to be uh, something that uh, we can take. So we cannot think about physical training when uh, when we talk about young players, because I think that every single skill they develop has to be um, with the ball. Uh, I think probably, but it is not my job. Something uh, has to be made uh, uh, in terms of coordination, but specific coordination. I don't think that mm, there is general coordination. I think that co we our kids build their coordination according to their activity. So the the coordination for a swimmer uh, is different from uh, from uh, the one of a of a football player. Sorry, Seba, if I'm not answering the uh, to, to your question properly, but this is not my job. This is your job. Uh, James Fallon asked, ask, at what age or level do you think coaching becomes more instruct instructive patterns of play than basing it on creating the right condition, if ever? I don't think that patterns, so, uh, James, I don't think that patterns of play uh, is something that uh, works in football. This is my my opinion. So everything uh, has to be connected to decision making, and decision making is always affected by by the environment. Again, environment it means the opponent, my teammates, the way my teammates move, the the way the opponents move. So how can I uh, decide the, the pattern of play? Uh, so patterns of play is something that can be disrupted after the first pass because we we don't know you don't know what the opponent is um is doing 
I would uh, always work on uh, our ability, our sorry, our players' ability to read the position, to read the opponent, uh, and to decide according to what the opponent is doing. So, uh, and to move, especially time and space. But I would never, I would never give my players a pattern of play. Patrick asks, is it bad for learning to have the same activity multiple times in a week with different elements, focus each time you use it? Uh, no, I don't think it's bad. I think that uh, you can work on, uh, um, let's say, to have a, to work on the same uh, uh, target and maybe change the, um, the, the structure. Uh, of uh, of your of your uh, drill, so um, I don't think it's bad um, for learning. Nothing is bad for learning as long as you know what you're what you're coaching. Um, so once again, I would like to uh, let's say to um, give my opinion also to um, variations in uh, in uh, during the sessions. Um, I don't think that. Uh, it's good to have many, 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 um, a, a lot of dr different drills, because I think that, especially with the, with the young players, when they get the sense of the drill that you, you, you create for them, then if you repeat the same drill, maybe after a couple of days, they already know what the, what is the structure and the meaning of the drill, and then they can start to be more um, concentrated, more focused on their improvement. So they don't, they don't have to think again how to uh, understand the, the drill, because if you change every time, then maybe they waste their energy, their mental energy to understand what you want from them. So maybe if you can use the same drill multiple times, it's fine. I think it's fine. Who's involved in that? So I can say again the ball. Uh, yeah, I've, yes, of course. Uh, yeah. You, uni, uni, I'm, he said losing the ball is defensive transition and regaining the ball is an offensive transition, of course. Uh, but this is just definitions. So um, the meaning uh, is, and the, the most important thing is, in my opinion, that our uh, players, even young, they know exactly what is required in the four different phases of the game. So, uh, and this can be uh, understood also by a eight years old player, nine years old. What should I have to do? What I have to do when I have the ball and when, when my teammate have the ball has the ball? What do we have to do individually or collectively when we lose the ball, do we have to do something? So, and this is something that you can work on according to their age, because of course, if I, I, I have a, a team of nine years old player, I will try to make them understand this concept in a different way, using different words. If I have, I'm working with the 17 years old players, 18 year old players, it's totally different because they can understand also something more um, you know, in depth, something, some details more. Uh, what is the perfect game practice we can use for un under 13 to under 15? Game practice, you can use, uh, uh, I would always use, for me, the four against four with the goalkeepers or without the goalkeepers. Four against four is the basic game practice that I will always use because they can have a lot of touches with the ball on the ball. They can see, they can have the different uh, uh, directions. They can use the width. They can use the, the depth of the, the, um, the, the field. Uh, and you as a coach with four players, let's say four, not more than four players involved, you can always have, uh, you can always focus on, on every single player. What is uh, Nils 
asks, what is your opinion of coaches' intervention during a session? Stopping the drill to coach. Often allow for problem solving from the player. Okay, I would use, I wouldn't overuse the stopping the drill. Uh, for example, why I don't uh, stop the drill? For example, uh, if I'm working on possession and if my players lose the, the ball, I'm not stopping the drill because I want them to experience the consequences of losing the ball. So if every time, for example, they lose the ball, I stop the drill, I said, why you, or I want to coach them because I can see the reason why they lose the ball. But this prevents me to see what they do and, and especially they pre it prevents them to experience the consequences of losing the ball. So I wouldn't use, I wouldn't stop often. I would, uh, and also I would ask them every time uh, how to, so to, to, I would ask questions, why you did that? But always re in regard with the, the decision making. So don't, in my opinion, this is my advice, don't stop uh, a player for a bad touch or a bad pass, uh, stop and um, if you want, give correction to the players for the, the decision they made, because this is the way we can affect them. So we can help them to take better decisions, but not better touches. So for, for, with regard to, the, to the, the touches of the ball on the ball, the, the techniques, we have just to make sure that they can experience daily, day in, day out, all the different um, situations uh, and make sure they, they can improve. But uh, don't do it too often. I mean, if we want to um, help our players, let them play, let them experience, and then ask them uh, what, why they did something, why they, they took some decisions. Uh, Jordan asks again, when you say that you never give your players a pattern of plays, that that include with first team players or with just youth players? Again, uh, especially with the, with the adults, because this doesn't change. So uh, with youth players, if you don't give pattern of play, you help them how to read the game. With adult players doesn't in my opinion doesn't change the fact that it's still the opponent that uh, give you uh, the let's say the way how to read the situation and how to play accordingly so i will never use patterns of play you can in my opinion for example we have a fantastic coach now in england roberto de zerbi roberto doesn't give any pattern of play he works on positions so uh, but i would do that especially with older players i would use positioning on the field to to create something and to create a, a reaction for the of, from the opponents but the way that you move the ball is always uh, related on what the opponent is doing so you can decide before you can't plan in advance the, the, the directions of the ball. Ciao Eugenio, old friend of mine. You have coached in pro, pro youth sector in which some of your players have moved up to under 19 and first team. Yes, true. What are the factors that impress more from a talent player in your experience? Uh, first of all, I would say the... Um, it would be easy to say that the technical qualities, but is what they do with their technical qualities. So in, I had the, the, the privilege to, to coach some players, young players that now are playing Serie A. Uh, and I can say that their best skill was their, the, their decision-making, what, uh, the, what they decide to do with the ball. And then they have the ability, they, they have and they had the ability to execute their action in a, in a, effectively. But uh, the, their best skill was 
the reading of the game, um, what to do in different situation. Uh, so this is, in my opinion, I would call it uh, tactical intelligence, uh, reading of the game. Uh, but once again, when uh, I coach these players, I will never, I, I never ask them to do something that was uh, out of the context. So I let them always experience the real, the reality of the game, and uh, draw from uh, from the from this reality. So I, especially under seventeen. Um, it's not different from uh, from when you coach uh, younger players because still when they are 17 18 they everything that they can draw from the game is uh, beneficial for them pierre i have 10 years old uh, 10 years old play, uh, players i think we let them to do knee control every now and then only with their own body weight. We take exercises on the Swedish association. What do you think of, it, of this? Uh, I think this is something related to physical, to the physical um, uh, part of it. Because of course, if you, with 10 years old players, kids, you just need to, to work on their, with their uh, body weight. So of course there, there is not, no, no weight involved. But this is something that is not exactly my area of interest. Sorry, Pierre. Vasco. Ciao, Vasco. Coach, at what age should the position of the, of the place be specified? Do we coach positions or functions? Absolutely the, the, the latter. Especially when they're young, I would, I would uh, work on functions. So um, when uh, I coach young players, I always try to make them understand just two basic things. The concept of builders and invaders. So if we, builders are the players that are involved in the possession and invaders are the players that are not involved in the, in the vicinity of the ball and they have just to find the space where to receive. Uh, I think this is the basic thing and the main thing that we can use with the young players. Especially, especially with very young players, because this is something that they can get, they can understand. Uh, what is their function in that moment, rather than the position? I think that the position should be more specified when they are 16, 15, but there is not, I think, uh, an exact age. Uh, of course, sometimes you can see a player, even uh, yeah, at the younger age, that is already... Uh, uh, his uh, his uh, skills are already defined, but it's not so uh, is it's not so easy to to understand or to see. I would work uh, more on the functions uh, and make them understand what to do in a specific area of the field or in a specific situation rather than a position. Matthew asks, can focusing on position specifics limit a player's physical and mental development? If yes, would it be better to emphasize more free flow of play to boost confidence and reading of the game? I think that I could answer the same way uh, I did with, uh, with Vasco. So I wouldn't uh, work on position specific because I think that when they're young is uh, always good to make them understand what to do in the different uh, situations rather than positions. This is my my opinion. Okay, I think that 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 was the the last question. Um, I would like to uh, thank all of you again for uh, being here and um, I hope you enjoy that despite my sometimes bad English. Ryan, don't kill me. No worries, Mavri. Thank you. No. And uh, okay. Um, I would like to let everybody know that uh, Ryan, if you want to give my 
um, my email address because I think that could be good also to if someone wants to go more in the details and to share ideas, I'm always available to do that because I think that this kind of uh, topic is too important and too, um, let's say, too big to be developed and to be discussed just in, a, in a one hour and a half. Uh, so uh, once again, I'm available to, to answer any questions that anyone wants to pose afterwards thank you again um ryan yep that's it thank you fabri and everyone else we will follow up uh, in the next day or two with the recording of the lesson and some of the material of the lesson as well and uh, contact information for fabrizio and coco as well so thank you guys for staying on and uh, being a part of this with us and we have many more opportunities and webinars to, to look forward to so thank you guys bye Bye-bye.